Hello everybody and welcome back. I'm Deborah Hartswell and you're tuned into BBR Cryptid and Paranormal Investigations. Thank you for joining me and I really appreciate you tuning in. I hope you are well and enjoying your day. Invisible beings, predators or unseen foe. I've been in contact with a gentleman by the name of Christian for many years now. Christian has had some experiences and events in the past he wanted to share with me. And now he isn't making any claims here and he was happy for me to share them with you. He's merely explaining a strange set of circumstances that have left him with questions he can't answer. And the need to know if anyone else has experienced anything like this in the area of Yorkshire or Nottingham or anywhere else in the UK. I'm hoping by sharing these accounts, we'll find others who have experienced the same or similar invisible beings or perhaps have an answer to what happened to the witnesses and what they saw and even why. Now, the encounter took place near a village called Paul, which is several miles northeast of the city of Hull. It's rural and it's on the coast, so it's pretty desolate at night. The year was 2002 or 2003, and Christian said, I started visiting the area in late summer or autumn of that year. I lived in Hull at the time with my girlfriend and our young daughter. I had two good friends who I used to go out playing pool with, Johnny, who was my girlfriend's nephew, and his friend Bob. In the evening, we'd go out in the car to Paul, which had three good pubs, all with pool tables, And to complete the group, there was Patch, my Jack Russell dog, who we took along for walkies before we went to play pool. Now, the lane we used to go down to let Patch have a run is called Newlands Lane. It's a narrow, lonely, quiet country lane with hardly any traffic. It was so quiet, we could even sit in the car and let Patch wander about the lane by himself. If something did come along, you could see the lights from quite a distance and I'd go out and get him off the road and put him in the car with me. He never usually ventured far from the car and we would just sit and talk and have a cigarette. Now, the dark nights came and we continued our routine of parking up in the passing place. I would let Patch out of the boot because there was no parcel shelf on there and he was quite happy and he'd go and have a wander about. It was even easier to see cars coming in the dark with their headlights visible from a great distance. One evening we'd been chatting away and John suddenly noticed we hadn't seen Patch for a while. I wasn't too worried initially and I just called his name through the open window. Nothing. I called again and then got out. Still nothing. There was no sign of him. To cut a long story short, There followed 20 minutes of frantic calling and searching torches before Patch finally turned up. He came trotting down the lane from behind the car, seemingly none the worse for his little adventure. No more was mentioned about this incident until we went back a couple of nights later. We parked in our usual spot and it was very dark and quiet. I got out and went to open the boot. I had a large black box in there which I kept my tools in and everything. And Patch had got behind it somehow and was hiding there. Now, a word about Patch. He is sadly no longer with us, but he used to love riding in the car. However, he loved his walkies more than anything. And he should have leapt out of that boot as usual, but he just stayed put. When I moved the box and took hold of his collar, he was shaking violently. And I quickly realised he was terrified. And this was very odd as this dog wasn't scared of anything. I tried to calm him down and reassure him. And as I didn't want him doing anything in the car, I did try to get him out several times, but he had other ideas and he just jumped straight back into the car every time. This happened over and over and he was obviously just too frightened. In the end, we had to drive to another area so he'd relax. And as soon as we were away from the lane, he was fine. This continued to happen over the next few weeks, with Patch slowly getting a bit bolder each time, but he was still totally freaked out by the place and very rarely went far from the car. We'd soon realise exactly why he was scared. 
We continued to visit New Lynn Lane with Patch, but he would only come out of the boot if we stayed out of the car with him. In a way, it was quite comical looking back on it. He would quickly run to a nearby spot, have a wee whilst watching us closely, making sure we didn't get back in without him, and then run back to the car as fast as he could and jump in the boot. Shortly after what we called his fright night, we had parked up at the passing place. Patch had already been out and we were taking, just talking and having a smoke. The topic of conversation was what could have scared him that night. He would never be that afraid of a person, so we decided it probably be in an animal, something he'd maybe never seen before. You hear about these big cats being sighted in the countryside and we figured it was maybe one of those. I'd almost finished my cig when I noticed John had gone very quiet. I looked at him and saw he was staring straight ahead, looking at a bend in the road about 150 yards away. I followed his gaze to where he was looking, and it was quite dark down the lane, but my eyes eventually got used to it. I could see that there, where the road disappeared at the bend, there was a clump of bushes to the right, and these bushes were about six or seven feet high. And as I stared, I could just make out a dark shape. It was a figure partially obscured by the bushes. Can you see that? John was asking. And I said, yeah, I could. Rob was sitting in the back and he was asking, what's up? He couldn't see anything. As we watched in silence, it, whatever it was, slowly emerged from the slight cover and moved into the road just a couple of feet. Now, I couldn't see any features. It was just a solid black humanoid shape that was around six feet tall. It just stood there as if staring in the car. John kept saying, what is that? I reached out for the ignition and I turned it so the power was on, but not into the start position. I reached for the headlight full beam. John could see what I was going to do. Ready? And John said, go for it. I pulled back on the stalk and the whole lane lit up in front of us, including the bend where it was standing. It was plunged into brilliant white light and nothing. Nobody was there. We were sure, positive, that we'd seen a figure step out and stand in the lane watching us. Nothing could move that quickly and be out of sight. We looked at each other in disbelief. What the hell was that? asked John. What did you see? said Rob. We described what we'd seen to Rob, who hadn't seen anything due to his position in the car. With the lane now back in darkness, we discussed what it could have been. Perhaps our eyes were playing tricks on us. Both of us seemed unlikely. As our eyes once again got used to the gloom, John suddenly said, it's back. And sure enough, the figure could again be seen hiding behind the thin cover of the bushes. It copied its earlier movement, as if taunting us in some way. Again, I hit the lights, and again, nothing. We decided it was time to go. As I drove up to where we'd seen this humanoid-looking thing, I slowed right down and stopped. We had all our windows down, listening and looking, but nothing could be seen and the only noise we could hear was the engine. We drove off to the pub and talked a great deal about it when we was in there. Was this the thing that had scared Patch? Or was it a coincidence? We were all really creeped out. In the coming weeks, our visits to Newlands Lane would be accompanied by some sightings of this figure. It kind of became the norm. It seemed to be getting bolder every time and quite often moving right into the middle of the road. On occasions, you'd see it once and then it would disappear. Then the noises could be heard at the other side of the hedge, some kind of movement, footfalls, even the sound of something heavy landing in the field as if it was thrown. All the time these noises were heard, Patch would be growling in the boot of the car. Sometimes the figure would be seen out in the corner of your eye, darting quickly out of view as you tried to get a proper look. There were lots of strange things that happened in that lane, some of which I've forgotten over the years. 
I will, however, never forget the next and last encounter we had with this thing. The encounters at Paul seemed to be intensifying, as if this thing was testing us somehow, seeing how far it could go with us. This particular night, we had lots of snow in Hull and the Paul area. And by the time we got to our spot down Newlands Lane, the snow was a couple of inches deep at least. But it had stopped snowing. My memory's hazy, but I believe it was either late 02 or early 03. Our routine and sightings of it had taken over the pool games. Now we didn't go out for a game of pool as such, but more to experience this, whatever it was. Driving down the lane, turning around and then pulling over in a passing place on the left had become routine. Although that night the snowbound road and countryside gave a different dimension to things. The most obvious being it was much brighter. It was cold and very quiet as I let Patch back in the boot. We sat in the car with the windows halfway down having our smokes and talking in low voices. Watching the bend in the road ahead carefully, ears pricked for any noise. Nothing. There was no unusual activity at all. We actually remarked on how quiet it was, both in nature and with this thing not showing itself. There was no sound at all. The night was still. I remember my window was open and I was smoking. I was on my second cigarette by then. And then everything changed in a second. It all happened very quickly, felt like milliseconds. I remember hearing a noise near the back of the car, faint at first, but getting louder, quickly. I was aware of Rob in the rear passenger side, leaning out of his window to investigate what the noise was. As I realised what the noise was, the car suddenly erupted into noise, very loud noise of shouting and screaming and swearing and panic. A loud bang sounded from the rear of the car. I automatically reached for the ignition and start the engine out of pandemonium and made it out a few words of go, go, go. It's an odd sensation. You want to get out of there quickly. You know something horrible is happening, but you know if you floor the accelerator with every instinct is screaming at you to do, you're going nowhere. At that time, I had a Volvo 340, which is rear wheel drive not the best vehicle on a snowbound road. So I had to gently accelerate. Even being careful, the rear wheels just spun on the slippery road at first. And all the time, I was being shouted at, swore at, screamed at, and I'll quote, get the f*** out of here. Slowly, painfully, painfully slowly, the car started to move forward. And as soon as it did, I slipped into second gear and put more revs on, as much as I dared. We were moving now at a fair rate. I brought the car up to about 30 miles an hour at a crazy speed on that road, but it still seemed way too slow. We cleared the first bend and against great protest from my passengers, pulled over roughly a quarter of a mile away at another passing place. It was only now I realised Rob in the back was sprawled across the back seat holding his head. Had he been attacked? No. Apparently, he'd banged his head hard on the door frame in panic, trying to get his head back in the car after what he'd seen. That was a loud bang that I'd heard. He was okay, with just a slight cut to the back of his head. I hadn't seen anything, but I did hear it. And what I heard a second before the panic was footfalls in the snow. You know that crunching sound you hear when you walk in snow? John and Rob were scared, but also excited. They kept saying, did you see it? Did you fucking see it? Over and over. Also, what the fuck was that was said a lot. I was scared too, but I hadn't seen what they had. John had seen it. Initially by looking out of his passenger window, then through the wind mirror. Rob had been closest and saw the whole thing, with his head hung right out of the rear door. What had they seen? Well, this is going to sound insane, but I do believe them. I've never seen anyone that scared in my life, even to this day. Rob and John's descriptions were the same. Rob said he heard something approach in the rear of the car, like I had. He stuck his head out the window and looked back, and he saw footprints appearing in the snow. 
no feet or legs or body to accompany them, just footprints coming towards the back of the car. He even described the snow flicking off non-existent feet. John's description was the same. It was unbelievable, but yeah, I just experienced it. I was a lot of things at once, scared, excited, stressed, but at the same time, curious. I had to know. Again, and with protests, I slowly, carefully turned the car around and I headed back to where we'd been parked. At once, as I drove back, you could see in the headlamps footprints in the snow. They led into the field beside the car, about 15 or 20 yards from where we'd been parked. Clearly, whilst we were talking about what we'd seen and heard, it had been following us. It had almost got right up to the car. We followed the print slowly this time, with the windows up and the doors locked. Returning to our original parking spot, we noticed that the prints went right past where the car had been parked. When we set off, it would have been up against the passenger side. We kept on following the prints, now clearly standing out in the snow. The prints ended, or rather began, in the middle of the road about 100 or 150 yards away from our original parking place. We stopped going up there after that night. Was it one of the men in the car that was a catalyst or an attraction to this energy or this being? You know, was their continued visits to the lane the reason the phenomenon ramped up? Without knowing if anyone else in Paul or Pot the Paul area or in Newlands Lane has experienced anything strange. I'm hard pushed to know if it's the area itself or the gentleman visiting that set the events in motion. In time, after years of chatting with Christian, I do believe he was the catalyst. I think certain people open up an area, almost like a missing key. These people tend to have a lifetime of strange events. And sometimes it can be the area itself that opens us up to receive. And this can happen at any age. Now, the way the humanoid figure behaved is strange. It could have stayed hidden at all times. Yet it showed itself over and over on numerous occasions. Was this to entice the men out of the car? Was it an attempt to ambush? Or was it looking for a way out of the area? Or even another host? I don't suppose we'll ever know. As I was chatting with Christian, I asked him if he had ever experienced anything other than the humanoid figure that you saw with the dog. I asked because, as I explained, you tend to find with some witnesses the sighting is not the only event that's happened to them. If you dig a little and listen a lot, most people have a story to tell. For many people, it starts in early childhood and it can span a lifetime. And there are periods where nothing happens, almost like a remission. Then visiting somewhere, meeting someone, or even a change in mood can set things off again. Christian explained he'd also experienced things as a child most would consider strange. He said, I remember one thing that really stands out from my childhood. I called it the invisible breather. When I was around eight or nine, I would hear it breathing in my bedroom. It was terrifying. It was not the only incident involving that bedroom and that house. On another occasion, I witnessed a glowing figure and it ran by my open bedroom door. I later described it as the Michelin Man, as the brief sight I got of it reminded me of this character. Now, I've always felt not alone. Like there's something following me close behind, said Christian. But there's never anyone to see. Just that feeling of not being alone. And then in my teens, I seem to have more and more experiences that I just could not explain. So I asked Christian to write down any events or strange circumstances he remembered from early childhood or in his teens. And I, I think it's something that everybody should do. Because sometimes when we list all of the events that we've had classed as individual events, it enables us to see just how many there have been. 
And sometimes it can show a pattern in the experience that might clue us into what's happening. Listing them all together stops them being individual events and it enables you to see just how many there have been when they are all on the same page, so to speak. And this is what Christian wrote. Deb, here's a written account of Nina's quarry that we were talking about. This happened to me back in 1989, and it was probably either late summer or early autumn, as there was plenty of leaves on the tree still, and I don't remember it being cold. Myself and my friend Lee had decided to pay a visit to a creepy quarry at night. Niner's Quarry is its known locally, has a reputation for being haunted. And being quite young at the time, it was a sort of dare to go late at night and see how long you could last out there. As I say, Niner's is a local nickname for the quarry. The actual name is Park Bolt Quarry, and it's just southeast of Nottingley. We arrived at the Broomhill side main entrance to the quarry about 12 midnight. As we walked down along the main path, we noticed a small fire burning to our left. There didn't seem to be anyone around or attending the fire, so we just kept on walking. And we went all the way through the wooded area, which is sadly no longer there. But back then, it was near the southwest boundary of the quarry. The night was still, fairly mild, and remember there was just a light breeze. And it was quiet, and we appeared to be alone. We decided to walk back along the main path and as we did so, we once again arrived at the fire which was now dying down. We sat around it for a second wondering what to do and not really wanting to go home yet. We talked about it for a minute and we decided to walk up onto the ridge on the north boundary. This can be seen on Google Maps and it appears like some steps going down from the west to the east. We got up onto the high point of the ridge and surveyed the quarry below, which was about 30 or 40 feet down to the quarry floor. We could see most of the quarry from this vantage point. I was about to turn to Lee, who was standing beside me, and ask if he'd seen anything, when a sudden noise from below caught our attention. The quarry floor was limestone, so anything down there that was moving would make a noise that stood out quite well. The noise we heard was loose limestone being disturbed as something, a figure, moved very quickly from about level with us to our extreme left. We think it had been hiding behind a large slab of rock out of our viewpoint. It was mesmerising to watch this thing. The few brief seconds it was in view were incredulous. The speed was incredible. It moved like an Olympic sprinter but yet the noise it made on the shale was minimal. No features could be made out. It was almost like a shadow. We just saw a dark figure moving quickly across the rock and shale. It disappeared to our left, where our view was obscured by the ridge, and it couldn't be heard anymore at that point. We just stood there in silence and slowly turned to face each other. Lee kept mouthing, what? but didn't get any further because as he turned to face where this thing had disappeared, the noise started again. We both heard loose limestone being disturbed by movement and it was getting louder and closer. I think it was using the cover of the rock to approach us unseen. Everything happened very quickly. Suddenly the noise started directly below us. There was complete silence. We turned to face each other once more, not looking puzzled anymore, now looking concerned and scared. We didn't have any time to react. I will never forget the sound we heard below us. There's a grassy, steep, sloping bank below us which gave way to a sheer limestone rock face and that's about 30 foot high. What we could hear was the sound of loose rocks falling to the ground. Whatever it was, it was climbing up the quarry walls. And as we realised it together, the sound had already stopped. And I remember we were both staring down at the point where the rock face joined the grassy bank. A dark humanoid figure was there, moving stealthily towards us and going through the grass. In an instant, it was like a spell had been broken. 
We turned and just jumped about eight feet to the field below. We both hit the ground hard and for a second, a horrible second, I thought my legs would buckle and I'd be left there alone with it. But somehow I managed to stay up and then I was off running. I looked round while still in the field but nothing was behind us. We ran most of the way through the Broomhill estate. All I could think of was what the hell was that? We went back the next day during daylight and stared in belief at what it had climbed up in about three seconds. The rock face is a good 30 feet high and it's sheer. We even brought a rope and tried to recreate what it had done and it took us minutes rather than seconds. And then there was the way it moved. It was very fast and really stealthy. In that respect, it was more like an animal. We did see it again at other times and we had other encounters with this thing over the next few weeks. A number of days had gone past since our first encounter with this weird thing at the quarry. We discussed it at great length and what it could have been. Now normally you'd have a rational explanation to explain all this away. But we just couldn't explain it. How do you climb up a sheer vertical rock face at 30 feet in three seconds or less in the dark. We decided to go back in the dark and see if we could see it again. Not late this time, and we had something for protection. My gran, who was sadly no longer with us, used to live on the Broomhill Estate in Nottingley, about half a mile north of Niners. Lee and myself got ready at her house. We got prepared this time. I had a BSA Meteor Air Rifle, which underslung had a powerful 3D cell torch. Not exactly a 12 gauge, but it felt good to have it. And we climbed over my grand's back garden wall and headed for Niners once again. The night was still, it was quiet as we walked across the field. We arrived at the quarry about 9.30, this time changing our path by mounting the ridge at the east corner overlooking a pond below us. We made our way back along the ridge, occasionally dropping back into the field due to the brambles blocking our path. Now, we didn't go down into the quarry this time. We just observed from a relative safety of the ridge. Nothing could be seen on the quarry floor and there was no noise either. We cautiously approached the area we had jumped down and we scanned the scene below us. I had a rifle and torch ready, but I hadn't used the torch much until now. I reached for the on button and as I did so, Lee patted me hard on the shoulder and he pointed and said, there, in a loud whisper. I followed his pointing and I could just see something behind one of the large slabs of limestone. I could only see part of it. It looked like the same thing as last time. A dark figure with no features. It had a kind of mesmerising effect to it. It was terrifying but at the same time, fascinating. As I stared at that figure, I could see it and it appeared to be watching us and its upper body was heaving like it was out of breath and gasping for air. As if it had been running hard. Again, as if the spell was broken, I turned the torch on. The beam was very bright and it lit up the area well and as I swung the rifle around towards the figure, I remember thinking, right, this is it. We're finally going to see what it is, once and for all. And as the beam drew near the figure, the torch went out. I frantically pressed the on-off button over and over again to no avail. I banged the torch with my palm and this didn't work either. It was just dead. And I had specially put new batteries in it earlier that night. By this stage, our fear was reaching boiling point. The figure was still there and I felt it could attack at any moment. I couldn't fire at something if I didn't know what it was, so I aimed at the rock it was behind. I indicated to Lee to run as soon as I fired. I didn't hesitate. I just fired the warning shot and didn't wait for the consequences. I heard the pellet hit the rock and that was it. We were off across the field, sprinting for Grant's house as fast as we could go. After a hundred or so yards, we glanced around behind us whilst fast walking to catch our breath. 
but we couldn't see anything. Upon getting safely to the house, I double-checked the torch and it came on. I flicked the switch off and on several times. It worked every time. What caused the malfunction in the quarry? And was that figure the same one we'd originally seen? This time, it hadn't tried to approach us. Was it because it was not something strange? Was it because it knew we had a weapon? Or what a weapon was? In the coming weeks, we continued to visit the quarry, both during the day and at night. We would only ever see the figure at night, and only fleetingly. Once, whilst being chased by a large gang, we made our escape via a small path that leads past Niners and out onto the fields. We'd just got into this path adjacent to the Broomill estate, and as I ran, I glanced to my right, and the entrance to Niners could be seen about 100 yards away. I noticed a dark figure standing perfectly still near the entrance to the main path. It just looked odd, in a sort of hunched over pose. Again, there were no features that could be seen. It was just black, and I only saw it for a few seconds. We'd become quite obsessed with seeing this figure, and we told one of our friends, Nick, who decided to come with us one night in the hopes of seeing it again. Off we went, across the fields from my grand's house. It was about 10, 15 minute walk. The night was still and clear, and it was about 9pm. We decided this time we'd go in on the main entrance, just like we did on the original sighting. I'll explain here that if you're looking on Google Maps, it's not the Womersley Road entrance. That road's where the lorries used to go into the quarry. You need to look for a wide path across the field from the Broom Hill Estate. We walked down this path, and as we got closer, the atmosphere just sort of changed. It became more and more expectant, like you knew something was going to happen. You could feel it, you just didn't know what. Suddenly, there was a commotion of barking dogs coming from in front of us and to our right. Now, next to the main path on our right, there's a boundary fence of a house with a large plot of land, and the dogs belong to that house. Occasionally, they would bark at passers-by. As we approached the entrance to the house, we realised that the dogs were not barking at us. They had gathered next to the fence where it bordered with the quarry and they were barking eagerly at something hidden that we couldn't see in the bushes next to the fence. They were really going mad. We went past the commotion and carefully walked a little way into the quarry. The dogs now muffled a little by the shrubs and the bushes. We were confused and curious as to what they were barking at, and we just stopped and stared towards the bushes, trying to see in there. What happened next was like a dream. It was just surreal. I remember hearing at first the bushes moving and then seeing branches and even whole shrubs shaking and bending over and snapping, etc. But not being able to see what was doing it. Something was moving through the undergrowth rapidly towards us, but it was invisible. With the commotion it was making, it sounded as big as a large man. There was a barbed wire fence that boarded the bushes and separated that part of the quarry from the main path. As we all stood staring in a kind of fear and fascination, almost like an induced trance, this fence was hit by something, like someone had just run straight into it. You could hear the wire creaking and cracking under the strain. Then an instant later, it just stopped. Then I heard and felt something big and heavy dash past me. It came very close to me. I didn't see anything, but I felt the ground at my feet shake as it went past. I spun around quickly to see nothing, and there was nobody. How could that be? We all stood in silence, slowly coming to from our experience. The whole event felt hypnotic almost. Nick had been a little way off from me and he'd not felt the vibration, but he'd heard the thing run past. He'd seen the bushes moving and also the fence. Lee had been standing close by and had felt the ground shake like I did. 
I don't think we ran, but we walked quickly and quietly back to Brew Mill. We didn't want to go back across the fields. We had no rational explanation for any of this. And to this day, we still discuss it. Although I've lost contact with Nick, I do still see Lee regularly and he helped me with this report as my memory isn't what it used to be. Now, there's a striking similarity between this thing and my other report of the one we saw in Paul, he says. It was a dark figure, almost predator-like, very agile and seemingly possessing a supernatural ability. But there's a distance of around 45 miles between Nottingley and Paul. And of course, the sighting took place 13 years earlier. Could the sightings possibly be connected? Both times we had a strong feeling it was playing with us, said Christian. It could have done something to harm us at any time. We were at its mercy, but it chose not to harm us. Is that proof of some kind of empathy? Christian. I believe the common denominator in all of these experiences is Christian himself. He said the accounts are years apart and there are many miles between the area. Christian was in both areas when the events happened. He was also with a number of differing people during the events. He's the only solid singularity. His presence, I believe, is what's caused the incidents to happen. He's sensitive to energy or beings somehow. Does he attract it? And if yes, why? Christine describes a being that moves just like the famous predator in the film. A fluid, moving, prismatic being. Now, there may be many reasons for this. The being may possess the natural ability to do that. It could be an ancient spirit of some kind, a being, an entity that's attached to the land. It could be an elemental blending in with nature in some way. There are also theories that cryptids, beings or paranormal beings use geomagnetic energy to achieve this almost invisible state. Others say it's a technology, not of this earth, something way beyond our comprehension. Was it reaching out to Christian and the other lads? Or was it luring them in? They mentioned a number of times that the experience was mesmerising, hypnotic, trance-like. Was it caught out on that snowy day when it's almost impossible to leave a track? And if so, why did the track start in the centre of the lane, 100, 150 yards away from anything? Are we dealing with something that can be both flesh and blood and yet not of the flesh when it chooses? The possibilities are endless. More and more of these reports are coming in from all across the UK and worldwide. Each person making report gives a different name, an invisible monkey, a glimmer man, a cloaked entity, a silver man, the prismatic thing, an invisible foot, to name just a few. And there are more reports like this. One that I said was Invisible Monkeys. And a gentleman named Ander who lives near Newport Pagnell said that he drives the roads of the UK and a number of deliveries he saw something impossible to explain. He likened it to the Predator Mover. And he saw something moving up the trunk of a tree but whatever he saw seemed to be cloaked in some way. After the first event, he repeated the journey in the hopes of finding a an, an simple explanation. Was it the way that the rain was, you know, glinting off the leaves or something like that? Was there something there that was reflecting back? And there wasn't. So he had to drive that road on a number of occasions and then he saw it again. So seeing a creature can be terrifying and a confusing event. But seeing something in stealth mode, moving through the trees that's impossible to describe, is a whole other level of fear. How do you put into words the prismatic thing before your eyes that looks like it's reflecting the light back or mirroring its surroundings? As Andy was driving to work early one morning, he saw what he described as the movement of energy, something similar to the invisible predator in the film. 
a swirling, moving enigma. And he did a double take, and they were still there. And they went up the tree like invisible monkeys. The next day, Andy took the same route to make sure it wasn't a reflection, as I said, or a trick of the light. But there was no reflection there, nothing it could reflect off. And it was a few mornings after that he saw the same prismatic energy moving up the tree. One other point to note, Andy lived in a very rural area. And one morning, when he was getting dressed, both he and his girlfriend heard a deep, heavy breathing up close to the window. And another area where he had a similar prismatic thing um, is in Woodhill Spa in Lincolnshire. And this report came in uh, by Chris Huff. He says, I've been to the dispersal and bomb dump of the former RAF Woodall Spa in Lincolnshire a few times now. It's an area partly covered by the woods of Osler's Plantation. Every single time there, I've experienced a very uncomfortable feeling of being watched, of not being welcome, and even a feeling of being threatened. On one occasion, in the period 2010-2011, I was in another part of the plantation, just a short distance away from the dispersal. A friend named Glenn Jolly, who sled races husky teams, was out practising around Osler's plantation in the early evening. When he and his two dog team got to a certain point, it's a crossroad of tracks through the woods, one of his dogs, Mika, reacted violently to an unseen presence. It was almost as though she was being attacked. Mika suddenly veered to one side of the track and Blade, the other but larger male husky, followed. The sled came to an abrupt stop, throwing Glenn off balance and off onto the ground. Then, as Glenn watched, Mika was on her back on the ground, howling and whining as though something was on her, attacking her. At this point, Blade stepped in and stood over Mika on guard. He had his hackles raised and he was snarling, which seemed to cause, whatever it was, to retreat to a nearby tree. For Blade, still on guard over Mika, with hackles raised and snarling, was staring at a point about eight feet high in the tree. Glenn didn't see anything and eventually managed to get the sled in order and it moved off and somewhat shaken by the experience. Now, a report that came in to me just this week is a rushing energy and a small boy. And the last said, where do I start? I've experienced quite a lot of unexplained things during the course of my life. I'm used to it. I don't pay it much thought, but there's quite a lot that happens that I want to understand or at least feel comfortable with it. Like it's just, you know, not just me experiencing it. The experiences I'm about to tell you about have been witnessed by me, my son, my friend and her son. When I came across your maps online and read a few of the reports, I thought, no way. And it jogged my memory about something we witnessed about two years ago now. We doubted ourselves so much and convinced ourselves it was obviously just our minds making things up. We kept questioning it. When something out of the ordinary happens, you think, did that happen? Don't you? Anyway, firstly, I'll tell you about what happened. I think it was in late September, early October. Me and my best friend live near each other and we take our boys to the same school. We do the same school run every day there and back. This one day we picked up the children and popped to a supermarket in Warrington, not far from where we live. We stopped for a while and we left, got what we needed and headed home. Now there's some woods behind the medical centre and you can take a shortcut. It takes you to a single bridge and the woods are called the Mary Ann Plantation. I think it was unusually dark that night. There was a black sky, but nothing fell off. We had got, done this walk so many times before. As we reached the middle of the woods, something ran past us and we couldn't see it. It was bigger than us. My friend's just under six feet and this was about seven to eight foot tall, I guess. We could feel how tall and big it was as it rushed by. It ran that fast that it took our breath away. The kids must have seen it too, as he said, what was that? I looked at my friend and she looked back at me and I could read what she was thinking and we got out of there as fast as we could. We couldn't make out what it was because it was darker than the darkness of the night. It's really hard to explain. All we saw was it kind of run 
like it had hind legs. I don't know how to process the fact that we saw and felt that. It was that close to us in those split seconds that our hair blew towards the opposite side that it ran past. We were in shock. All we could do was freeze in those few moments until we made our way onto the path and back to the main road. Where we live has only been here for about three years as we live in one of the new builds and we're literally on top of an old airfield. I went round to my friend's house one day and she only lives two doors down the road from me. Just went for a usual brew and a chit-chat before picking the kids up. I sat on a chair next to the window and I saw a little boy run past the front lawn towards the alleyway where we take the bins in and out. So I said, did you see where that little boy that just went past? And she said, no. Then I asked what he looked like and with an expression on her face as if she felt uneasy. I told her what I'd just seen and she just sat in shock and said, so it's not just me then, it's not in Marl in my head. And I said, what do you mean? And that's when she told me she sees that boy all the time. But for her, it's like an apparition, ghostly and not really there. I said, no, surely not. And then I saw it happen again. Ever since that day, I always see him around and he's always going in one direction, down the alleyway. We recently found out that our new neighbour, who lives between me and my friend, sees him all the time too. I feel like this little boy's trying to tell us something. Surely to have shown itself to three people during the middle of the day cannot be a coincidence, can it? The kids have seen it as well. And they've run down the alley after seeing something running that way and around the corner, but when they catch up, nobody's there. Sincerely, G.A. To me, the little boy's connected to the land and he's repeating what he did in life, almost like a residual loop. Each person sees him in a different way. For some, he's transparent and ghostly, yet for others, he's quite solid. I think this depends on the ability of the viewer. Psychic abilities, like all natural abilities, strengthen with use. And I think the young lady who wrote this email is probably very sensitive. She probably has parents and grandparents who are also sensitive. She may be the first person to walk that way that has tuned in to the rushing invisible thing. I also wonder if that will be the last time she'll experience it. I was able to reassure her she's amongst many and time and learning will help her to hone her skills. As we become confident in an action, we really start to perfect it. And that's the easy part. The hardest part is trusting what's happening. Trusting that you did hear it, you did feel it, you did experience it, whatever it may be. As we lose the mistrust and doubt, we start to lose to learn to lose the fear as well. I've experienced this washing energy. I'm not really sure what to call it. The first time I was standing outside a taxi rank of all places, it's about 2am in the morning, I was in my early 20s, and I was coming home from work. I was above a subway, and that's connected to where I was standing with a set of woods that just runs for miles. Behind me was a heavily wooded embankment, and I was standing at the top of that, next to the dual carriageway. I was waiting to cross the road to order a taxi. And the next thing, I felt this huge wind, is the only thing I can put to it, that moved my hair. It literally pushed past me with force. In fact, it made me wobble. I looked back, expecting to see someone coming at me, and there was just nothing. There was nobody there. It was really confusing. Not a soul. The feeling I got was run and run fast. I got over to the taxi rank as quickly as possible. I couldn't get that feeling out of my head. I heard, I'd heard the whooshing noise before, but I'd never felt it. I was kind of really confused. It felt like a tiny hurricane had gone past my left side on a still warm night on the north. Now, the second and third time it happened, I was in the woods, so not too dissimilar to the woods at the back of the medical centre that the lady mentioned in the last report. I was picking hazelnuts up off the floor as I'm in a forage. And you have to be careful down there. Sometimes you find homeless camps and beer cans and needles and all manner of, you know, miscreants. I was picking my way through the floor when whoosh, 
again. I got pushed to the ground with a huge shove. And it was like a solid wind. I looked back expecting I was about to get robbed for my phone or something by some low life. And there's nothing. No one. Anywhere. I couldn't make head nor tails of it. It's happened a number of times over the year. It even happened outside the Chinese chipper. And I'm, I'm not making that up. And if obviously if I was making stuff up, I'd come up with something a bit more exciting than that. I was with my friend and we both felt it. It went between the middle of both of us. So... I don't know what we're dealing with here, I really don't, but I'm hoping someone out there does. As I said, it's happened a number of years, number of times over the years for me, and once or twice at home, and I'm still puzzling out as I go along. I wonder how many of you have experienced the same thing. Thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe or like or share this upload with your friends. It really helps to support the channel. Check out our Patreon and podcast links in the description below. You'll get early sighting reports and exclusive podcasts. But for now, as the night's drawing closer and we're all getting tucked up earlier, have a lovely night and I will be back with some more strange tales for you later on. Good night, everyone. Thank you.